Hello, everybody, and in this lecture, we are going to be looking at um, variation in living people, right? So before we kind of jump into um, our own evolutionary history and start, you know, tracing some of these traits back into our um, distant past, um, it's important to understand, well, how do people vary today and why do we have the differences in phenotypic expression that we see in humans um, in modern times? Um, so now that we've really kind of covered uh, population genetics and um, the basics on evolutionary theory. Let's see how all that applies to our own species. So um, it's kind of important to set the stage here. Um, during Darwin's time, remember, there was this whole notion of the great chain of being and this whole idea of uh, proving either polygenism or monogenism, you know, either a single creation event or a multiple creation event. Um, post Darwin and post evolutionary theory, scientists and social scientists and naturalists began to kind of uh, start to realize that these um, kind of folk notions on race really have no scientific validity. So uh, right at about the start of the 20th century, you start to see this divergence of folk and scientific notions on race. Anthropologists and other scientists have started to observe the clinal variation of measurable traits. And all this means is that um, uh, we're going to kind of look at an example here, but um, to kind of put it roughly, uh, if you were to take a walk from, let's say, um, Nairobi in, in Africa all the way up to Stockholm in Northern Europe, there's not going to be like an area where you're going to all of a sudden cross into the land of white people, right? What you're going to notice is that people closer to Nairobi have very dark skin colors. And as you move away from Nairobi towards Stockholm, um, you're going to start seeing those skin colors getting lighter and lighter and lighter as you kind of make your way further north. That's what we mean by a clinal variation. We also have seen a non-concordant variation of traits, which means that there is a wide degree of variation in any single given trait within our species and that there are no set of traits that are exclusively unique to any given human group, right? And we know based on more recent genetic information that there is a single African origin for the human species, right? So uh, right in the 20th century, we began to realize that, um, you know, this whole notion of race, this whole idea that we can categorize humans based on race really doesn't have much foundation in actual biology. Um, if we were to take a line from Jonathan Marks, who's a um, human biodiversity professor, uh, he says that the more traits you looked at, the more races you could see, right? And this kind of goes along with that non-concordant variation in traits, right? So the more traits you're kind of looking at, you know, you're the one who's really starting to determine what the different racial categories are. Um, so physical measurements themselves do not identify distinct categories of humans to correspond with folk notions about race. So remember our good old buddy, George S. Cuvier? Um, well, he actually did quite a bit of writing about race. Um, he dissected Sarah Bartman upon her death in 1817, and Sarah was a native woman from Cape Town, South Africa, who uh, spent most of her life living in a traveling um, zoo in Europe. Uh, Cuvier, upon his kind of uh, examination and autopsy, claimed that she had um, anatomy that was more similar to that of an orangutan than a human. So this just goes to show you some of those kind of uh, early 19th century studies that happened before Darwin were really focused on this idea of placing different human groups on this kind of scale, you know, with, of course, white European individuals being the most evolved out of everybody and uh, people of color, of course, being the least evolved out of everyone. So um, it wasn't until 20th century did we really start to realize that this um, kind of thinking had no place in legitimate science. Um, and you kind of are reading it correctly. She did spend her life on display in a traveling zoo in Europe. As a matter of fact, humans were part of zoo displays for many, many years. Uh, I'm going to post a documentary that you can all watch for this week um, that actually talks about the uh, not only the kind of history of scientific racism as well as um, the story of kind of these human 
So what was the end goal of this kind of scientific racism um, that you see that we kind of talked about with Cuvier uh, as an example, as well as what you're going to see in the documentary for this week? Well, the goal was kind of the culmination of this practice called eugenics, which kind of started up in the early 20th century, which was the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable, heritable characteristics. And this actually was derived by uh, none other than Charles Darwin cousin Francis Galton and what this is is actually an extremely base oversimplification of what Darwinian theory is um, in essence what Galton was saying is that we can control the different people within our population allow only those with the best traits to um, breed and produce children and then successive generations will be stronger and better and we know that's not how genetics works today right if we were to do something like that all we would be doing is um, limiting the variation in our gene pool which will lead to more susceptibility of um, genetic diseases right remember we talked about the founders effect if you have a small very genetically um, similar population and a genetic disease pops up it will spread very quickly so this was really more based on explaining and justifying the social inequality and barbarism at the time than it was really actually trying to figure out any real scientific facts about the human species right and um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, eugenics did kind of start in the um, right at about the turn of the 20th century and really kind of fizzled out um, right at about the start of World War II. So this is just showing you some of the human zoos. These are some uh, people from the Philippines at Dreamland and Coney Island. This is a human zoo from the uh, in Belgium in the 1920s. This is uh, the Prince Pamiuk from the Chicago's World Fair in 1893. This is the Netherlands in 1958. So even all the way up until 1958, certain tribal people from Africa were still being paraded around in these zoos as some sort of display, right? So this kind of... Um, you know, we kind of wonder, or, you know, some people may ask themselves today, you know, if we kind of recognize all those things, why have we not made any progress in terms of diminishing racism um, globally? Well, this is really because of the kind of racist history that science kind of has had all the way up until about the uh, late 20th century, right? This whole notion that uh, early in the scientific days of studying humans, we were trying to prove that people of African descent were somehow different, a different species than us. And and once we realize that that uh, argument doesn't hold water, then they shifted to these intelligence arguments that, well, they're just simply not as intelligent as uh, white people. Um, and once those arguments have collapsed, um, now we kind of come full circle and we uh, go back to kind of talking about how there are these fundamental differences between uh, people of color versus others. So people, in essence, were displayed as curiosities for over 100 years, and people were generally kidnapped or coerced into participating in uh, a traveling human zoo. These zoos were used to justify social inequality, right? So if you can put these people on display, everybody comes and kind of looks at them, gawks at them. It's more easy for those people to associate those individuals with being animals rather than being human. And kind of a little fun fact for you, Hitler, Adolf Hitler was the first to ban human zoos. As a matter of fact, um, kind of Nazi Germany was the first to ban the, the practice of human zoos. So you know that if um, Hitler is banning your cultural practice, then you know that it's probably pretty bad. So when did scientific racism end? Well, the long story uh, short, it really hasn't, right? Even as close, uh, as really, you know, as recently as the 1990s, we've had these kind of um, hereditarian, um, kind of uh, heredity-based intelligence arguments that separated individuals based on race. If we look at the Bell Curve, which was published in 1994, it sought to prove that you can rank human intelligence based on race and that people of certain races were more prone to becoming criminals. Yes, we were still writing this kind of garbage in the 1990s. And um, this actually was debunked by Stephen Jay Gould and the Shaker City School System here in Northeast Ohio. It actually showed that given the right resources, there is no intelligence gap between races, right? Really the actual determining factor in, in children's development and, and intelligence is the amount of money, the amount of resources, and kind of some of these socio-cultural factors rather than anything to do with biology. 
We also have Nicholas Wade in 2014. So this was only six years ago. He published something called A Troublesome Inheritance, which echoed earlier notions of intelligence and biological difference based on race. Yes, if you assign certain genetic markers into these machines that separate human populations based on genes, depending on what genes you select, you can, in essence, create races, right? Um, as a matter of fact, you can enter, for example, you go to this, uh, this, this software program and you enter in, well, I want to find seven categories of genetic clusters. It's going to find seven categories of genetic clusters, whether or not those actually correspond to any real legitimate separation in those human groups. So this is just showing you if you come across these books, avoid them at all costs because they are in essence garbage science. This is showing you this came out of the bell curve, which is showing you the uh, frequency distributions for black and white IQ distributions. Um, and really what uh, kind of these two authors were saying was that, well, this was because of biological factors that you had this unequal distribution between uh, black versus white intelligence or IQ. Well, um, as an anthropologist and as one that was trained relatively recently, I can tell you for a fact that um, there is really no, uh, one, there is no IQ. Um, yes, you can create a test. Yes, you can create a scale that measures intelligence or what you think is intelligence, but really intelligence is this very multifaceted kind of aspect about human existence. Who gets to decide what's considered intelligent and what's not? Is intelligence simply memorizing facts out of a book or is someone who can take apart a car motor and put it back together considered on the kind of the same level of intelligence, right? Um, the example I like to use going along with the car motor is I can uh, write academic papers, I can get published in academic journals, I can teach courses and build uh, PowerPoint Points. My car mechanic can do none of those things, but my car mechanic can take my engine apart in my car and put it back together blindfolded. So there's just varying degrees of intelligence, right? So intelligence is not absolute. It is, of course, relative. So remember, as we move on here, we'll talk about um, some of the kind of variation that we see. There is no requirement that we divide the human species, i.e. Homo sapiens, into different subspecies or races, right? There are no pure quote unquote races anywhere, and there are very few genetic markers that are common to every one of a quote unquote particular race. As a matter of fact, genetically, the human species does not have a whole lot of variation. As a matter of fact, there is more variation between any two given emperor penguins who look identical on the outside than there is between any two given humans, right? We share 99.9999% of our DNA, and it's only a little bit under one-tenth of a percent that is different between any given humans. The most genetically diverse place on Earth is Africa, which makes a lot of sense because all people can trace their ancestry back to Africa if they go to back to about 100,000 years ago, um, some even further than that. Um, so it makes sense that we would have the highest amount of genetic diversity in Africa because it is the area on the Earth where we have had the longest to kind of interbreed, to move around, um, to kind of spread our genetic material and things like that. So this relates back to the out of Africa hypothesis. When we trace the mitochondrial DNA within our genome, we realize that it traces right back to Ethiopia, more specifically, um, basically Eastern Africa at or around, um, in some estimates, depending on the material you read, will kind of give you a, a, a different number. So you can kind of comfortably say anywhere between 130 to 200,000 years ago is when modern Homo sapiens arose in Africa. So let's take a quick look at some of the differences that we see between our own kind of evolutionary uh, end of the animal family tree versus other mammals, right? So how do primates in general vary from other mammals? Well, we have a um, humans and primates in general show a trajectory uh, towards the selection for eyesight and not smell, right? And we can kind of know this by looking at the different apparatus within a mammalian brain that looks at um, or processes smell. In humans, uh, as you can see on the left, that little kind of uh, yellow blob there with the uh, little squiggly lines coming out of it, that is your olfactory bulb. That is what receives and processes smell 
in your nose. If you look on the right, we have a dog skull, and you can see that the olfactory ball, which is kind of the lighter pinker um, organelle right in the front of the skull, is gigantic compared to the size of the brain, right? It's actually almost about a quarter the size of the brain. So that just goes to show you that that creature is one that can process a lot of different smells. As a matter of fact, dogs can smell almost on a molecular level. They can actually smell the chlorophyll within a blade of grass, right? So this just shows you primates' evolutionary selection towards sight because we have a small olfactory bulb, we have a giant brain, but a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of that brain is dedicated towards perceiving smell, right? We actually have way more of our brain that is dedicated towards uh, receiving uh, sight stimulus. Uh, we also have trichromatic vision, which is common among all primates, which means that we have three types of opsins within our eyes, um, in the cones within our eyes, and this discriminates between blue, green, and red light, right? So in essence, what we're doing is we're, those opsins allow us to differentiate between colors. And this is something that's common amongst all primates. When we get back to some of the more ancestral primates, um, kind of like prosimians, like lemurs and lorises, and we'll, we'll talk about about all of these guys in, in much more detail when we get to the next section of the class, which is primates. Um, but, you know, your kind of more ancestral primates only have a dichromatic vision. They can only see in two colors, uh, whereas kind of um, monkeys, apes, as well as humans can all see in trichromatic vision. And something that we'll talk about a little later in the semester is an interesting um, kind of pattern that we see or an interesting hypothesis regarding uh, color vision and fruit, right? We think that there may actually be a co-evolutionary relationship between fruiting trees and trichromatic vision. Because when we look at energy expenditures in plants, it actually takes a lot of energy for a plant to produce color. Right. And primates, we know today, are one of the primary creatures within the forest that eat fruits and disperse the seeds through their droppings. So we think that these, uh, you know, sometime in the evolutionary past, right around the time when primates first arose is a right around the same time you start to see fruiting trees and plants. Um, you know, arising on the earth as well, right? So there, we can't really ignore that relationship. Fruit trees have always been a kind of intricate part of primate evolution. So let's talk about modern variation in living people. And really this is kind of relating back to that um, selection towards sight that humans have, right? Um, if we take a look at it, within a few seconds of meeting someone for the first time, your eyes will assess several characteristics about them. What is their facial expression? What's the tone, skin tone? Uh, what color are their eyes, right? What color is their hair? We start to do all these assessments the instant we see somebody. And that's because as humans, we are more sight selected than smell. In terms of race, asking to know someone's race is common in law enforcement and forensics. It does matter what someone looks like if you are trying to locate them or identify them. But in terms of DNA, you cannot identify skin color by DNA. There are very few genetic markers that relate directly back to skin pigmentation. So if you look at this individual, you can see there are tissue depth markers that are um, kind of glued to the skull here. That's what those little um, little kind of uh, foam uh, cylinders are. And um, this actually relates back to um, we can determine based on these depth markers how much tissue deposition an individual may have had on their face, which can give us an indication of what quote unquote race that person could be. The features of this skull in particular suggest that the person is an adult African American male, so the tissue depth markers were cut according to those standards. And skin tone is a really great way to look at this notion of clinal variation, right? Changes in things like skin tone and blood group distribution occur in clines within our species, meaning there are no distinct boundaries or separating marks between groups, right? It's not like you all of a sudden cross the Mediterranean and you're in the, light, you know, the land of white folk, right? Um, you're going to notice the further you move away from the equator, um, the lighter and lighter skin tones become. 
So human races as clients, right? Clients are essentially the changes in the frequency or percentages of an allele or feature across space. Clinal distributions characterize the worldwide pattern of biological variation in humans, right? We are one of the few species that shows a huge degree of clinal variation. Thus, there is a reality to human races in that human populations differ from one another, but there is no reality to race as a set of distinct human groups with boundaries separating them from other such human groups. So remember that polygenetic skin uh, traits like skin color, hair color, adult height, and overall body proportions are strongly affected by the environment, right? In the next lecture, we're going to look at, um, you know, uh, high altitude adaptations as well as ultraviolet radiation adaptations and adaptations to heat and cold, right? So if we were to take a walk from Nairobi to Stockholm, using my example again, right, it's not like we're going to all of a sudden hit an area where you move from people of dark colored skin to people of light colored skin, right? You're, what you're going to see is a slow um, grade, right, you know, with darker colors being towards the equator and lighter colors being towards the poles. And this relates back to the layers of your skin and an interesting process that occurs within the layers of your skin called the melanocyte cycle, um, which all really occurs in the most outer layer of your skin called the epidermis, but you also have other layers, the dermis as well as the hypodermis. And melanin, which is produced by this uh, melanocyte cycle, um, is a brown-black pigment that is made in this uh, top layer of the skin. So you have these cells within that top layer called melanocytes. They react to the ultraviolet radi radiation from the sun that's beating down on your skin from sunlight, and they begin to produce melanin. So in areas where ultraviolet radiation is most intense are areas near the equator. And if we overlay that map on top of a map showing human skin tones, you are going to see that skin tones are darkest in the regions that get a lot of UVR, right? It's almost a one-to-one -one correlation. So um, it really kind of makes a lot of sense now when we see it this way that human skin tone is not due to some fundamental difference in biology. It is simply due to reactions to the levels of ultraviolet radiation that come through our atmosphere from the sun, right? It's our species response to kind of the global environmental context. So what other factors affect skin color apart from ultraviolet radiation? Of course, we have the transparency of the skin cells, uh, reflected color from your arteries and veins, and of course the type as well as the amount of melanin being deposited in your skin. So remember that skin tone is an evolutionary response to the environment and will likely take many, many generations to change. So I don't want you to fall into that kind of trap that as humans become more globalized and as cultures become more in contact with one another and we start to to marry and produce children with one another, that somehow all humans will eventually have a single skin tone, right? Well, that won't occur unless we have a constant uh, supply of UV radiation that is in constant levels across multiple parts of the globe. So we're not going to get into the whole process of the melanin cycle or the melanocyte cycle. All you need to know is that um, you, ultraviolet radiation from the sun hits your skin. The melanocytes in your skin react by producing melanin. And why do we have melanin? Well, melanin relates back to something we call the folate story, right? And folate is a very important nutrient. It's also called folic acid or vitamin B10 that we get from uh, leafy green foods, right? Folate's so important, you can kind of think of it as a superhero shown uh, here in blue, right? Helping make some DNA. Folate is necessary for DNA manufacturing and many other processes within your body. It's especially important during development of the baby and helps prevent against some very serious birth defects. And aha, so we're starting to see in terms of evolution, remember what we talked about um, in terms of when will natural selection act upon an environmental force within a population, it's when it begins to affect reproduction and the successful um, carrying of a baby, right? So we're dealing this ultraviolet radiation and the destruction of folate within your body is um, very, very serious environmental stress that needs to be dealt with or the species will in fact go extinct. So fierce ultraviolet radiation can destroy folate, so people in areas with very strong sunlight evolved darker skins, right? Lots of brown-black melanin, and the melanin acts as a shield against that folate destruction. 
Melanin is like a shield that keeps ultraviolet radiation from causing folate lysis, which is essentially uh, causing the little folate uh, molecule to burst. Folate prevents such burst defects as spina bifida and anencephaly. So dark skin in the tropics is an adaptation to a very, very serious, important environmental stress. So the moral of the story here is that natural selection selected for the prevention of folate destruction within our species by allowing us to develop the skin pigmentation, which only allows just the right amount of ultraviolet radiation through into our bodies to produce vitamin D as well as melanin. But it can kind of go wrong sometimes. You have other conditions where pigmentation, um, if you have a mutation, usually a point mutation in, in, in a particular gene, will cause um, some of these kind of issues with pigmentation. You have hyperpigmentation acne, which starts out as these, as these kind of irritated acne spots and ends up leading to this kind of differences in pigmentation that we see um, based on you know whether or not you pick at that acne. We also have vitiligo. We know a very famous person who uh, died within the past five years, uh, actually might even be almost 10 years now, um, who had vitiligo, right? This is Michael Jackson when he was uh, early in his career, and this is Michael Jackson towards the end of his career. There's always kind of that myth that he went through skin bleaching, and it's kind of a myth and kind of fact in, in the sense. He did do medical procedures to help um, even out the skin tone because vitiligo is a disease where, in essence, your skin slowly loses pigmentation and it does not do that uniformly across your whole body so you'll get these kind of splotches of lighter colored skin and darker colored skin um, in essence it's not a very uh, detrimental condition to have um, it doesn't really cause any type of uh, severe health effects or health issues um, other than kind of the exterior um, I guess um, other than the kind of um, uh, image issues that you might get from it so there are other nutrients within your body that are strongly affected by the um, relationship of ultraviolet radiation and your skin pigmentation. Uh, calcium is another important nutrient. It's uh, important for strong bones, muscle contractions that, that's involved in the con uh, construction of myosin and actin, which are proteins that help in moving your muscles, um, and many other things. We get it from food, but no matter how much calcium that we ingest in our food, it won't get used by our body without some vitamin D, right? So no, know this. This is kind of the most important part of this whole uh, lecture here. Vitamin D is made by our bodies. It's a nutrient that we naturally make in response to being exposed to ultraviolet radiation. And the manufacture of vitamin D starts in the skin. We're not going to go over all the nitty gritty details of how vitamin D is manufactured. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, what you need to know in terms of this is that vitamin D is necessary for calcium to leave your intestines and be utilized within your body, right? So people who live in areas where ultraviolet radiation is weak need paler skin with reddish brown melanin in order to get enough ultraviolet radiation to stimulate the production of vitamin D in your skin. So in essence, you eat leafy green foods and tiny bones of fish and small man animals that contain calcium. This calcium is then broken down in your intestines and the calcium is released. But in order for it to leave the intestines, vitamin D must act to allow the calcium out and then it can float freely in your blood. So it's just showing you calcium waiting in kind of your guts to get out. And the vitamin D is the key to get it out. So now calcium can get into the bloodstream and get to work at its various functions. So calcium combines with phosphates to make the hard mineral that is in your bones. The mineral gets woven together with collagen to become the bones that have a little bit of flexibility and that are not just simply hard, right? And that's why, you know, you can kind of take a, a, a nice hit to your, to your arm or your leg and not immediately crack a bone. That's why your bones aren't, you know, fragile, kind of like glass. But the skin uh, is more than a shield. It's actually an organ, right? And it starts with the synthesis of this vitamin D. So vitamin D is important for calcium absorption, like what we talked about. But vitamin D is also important for iron absorption as well, right? If you don't have enough vitamin D, it does not matter how much iron you, can, you eat, you will not um, be able to absorb it. And there are distinct conditions that we see that occur with individuals who aren't obtaining enough iron right? Um, what we call iron deficiency anemia. Um, there's another condition where the pelvis and a lot of the other bones in the body become malformed. Um, this is something that we call rickets. But there are several conditions that arise from having a lack of 
iron due to a lack of vitamin D. Another one that we see is cribral orbitalia, where you get this pitting in the orbits of the skull. So let's look at uh, human phenotypic variation, right? Why do we look different on the outside? Um, for example, one feature that we'll look at here is the prominence of the nose, which we know today is an adaptation to humidity, right? So the kind of, um, depending on how your nose is construction, uh, really kind of gives a clue as to where your ancestral people came from. If your nose is very thin and long, then you're from an individual who's from kind of a colder region in which you need um, that air to kind of travel through your sinuses to become warmed up before it hits your lungs. Um, as a matter of fact, we are going into the fall semester here, so we will soon uh, be able to experience this. If you go outside during the winter time and you take a nice big gulp of air into your lungs through your mouth and you don't use your nose, you'll notice some irritation right because your lungs do not like cold air right the lung the air that goes into your lungs needs to be a certain temperature and humidity right so your nose is actually adapted to achieve that right temperature and humidity for you so the differences we notice about people can tell us a little bit about geography in terms of nose shapes and size right and I use this uh, movie poster because it's a really good um, kind of um, shows that variation, right? Um, Dustin Hoffman's people likely came from a mountainous region that was warm, right? He's got a little bit of a wide angle to his nose. It's a little bit longer. Um, so it may have been a drier region. Um, he needed enough area, surface area to moisten the air as it goes in. If you look at Sharon Stone there, um, she has a very thin and long nose. Her people came from somewhere that was a little bit colder. The air was um, definitely a little drier. Uh, as well as if you look at Samuel L. Jackson on the right, you can tell that his people evolved or his ancestors came from an area that was very warm and, um, uh, you know, had an adequate amount of humidity, right, because this nose is a little bit shorter and it's a little bit wider, right? The nose is wider so that it can cool the air as it moves through the nasal passages and into the lungs, right? So depending on the size and shape of your nose can give us a slight indication of, as to where your ancestors spent many generations living. So to recap things um, before we move on, remember an individual skin color is an ancestral adaptation to ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun, that skin pigmentation is necessary to prevent folate lysis, that your body naturally produces vitamin D as a response to ultraviolet radiation, and that vitamin D is a crucial uh, nutrient for transporting vital vitamins and minerals like vitamin C out of the intestines and into the bloodstream. There is one last thing I want to kind of go over before we wrap up this lecture on modern human variation. Um, and be sure to watch the subsequent lectures, which go into more detail about human uh, evolutionary adaptive responses to heat and cold, as well as different environments, um, high altitude versus low altitude environment. Um, but what I kind of want to talk about that we may all be more familiar with is this notion of lactose intolerance, right? Or the inability to digest fresh milk products. And this is caused by the discontinuation or the discontinued production of lactase, which is an enzyme, uh, a protein, uh, an enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is milk sugar, right? In all human populations, infants and young can digest milk, but somehow, uh, you know, later on in life, really kind of towards uh, teenage to young adulthood, that the gene that uh, produces that lactase shuts off um, in most, uh, in certain populations of humans. And remember that lactose is a major ingredient in milk because milk is sweet. So lactose intolerance, in essence, what happens if you do not have the ability to break down, um, essentially lactase will break down lactose into glucose and gal galactose, right, which is then passed normally through your um, stools. If not, um, essentially what ends up happening is the lactose hits your uh, intestines. Um, your body doesn't have a way to break it down. So what it does is it tries to kind of water it down and it starts to suck water from different parts of your uh, cellular structure into your intestines. And that's what causes the kind of gas, the bloating, the bacterial overload, as well as the diarrhea that's associated with lactose intolerance. So in most people, that gene coding for lactase, the enzyme switches off by adolescence, which means that if too much milk is then ingested, it ferments in the large intestines, leading to diarrhea and cramps, right? Among many African and Asian populations, most adults are intolerant to milk. 
but we do have human populations that are tolerant to milk, and there is a reason we have that. What we notice is that the distribution of lactose tolerant populations is kind of interesting. Wherever we see an ancestral cultural dependency on milk products, we see individuals that have high degrees of lactose tolerance, right? So any places like the Pasteur of Fulani uh, in parts of Africa and the Middle East, uh, if we look at descendants of Middle Eastern goat herders, as well as Swiss dairy farmers, all of these kind of uh, individual populations all have, you know, existing in different parts of the globe, all have the ability to process lactose, right? The two populations in our uh, country that we see today that have the highest degrees of lactose intolerance are African Americans and uh, people of Asian descent as well. So in such populations where there's a cultural dependency on milk, there would be strong evolutionary selection force or pressure to shift allele frequencies in the direction of more lactose tolerance, right? So it'll, in essence, will let the gene for lactase stay switched on into adulthood. So why does this all matter? Well, it all relates back to types of adaptations that we utilize as a species to increase our biological fitness uh, in varying environments, right? And there are four main categories of adaptations I want you guys to know. You have genetic adaptations, much like the heterozygote condition and the sickle cell trait that we've already discussed. You have developmental uh, adaptations, which are physical changes to the environment, much like what happens with your nose, as well as um, what you're going to see in the next lectures when we look at um, heat, cold, and altitude responses in humans. You have acclimatization, which can occur anytime during life. This is when you go to a new climate and your body adjusts. Um, more particularly, when we look at acclimatization, we're really kind of talking about high altitudes, which we'll, we'll talk about in the next lecture. And then, of course, you have cultural adaptations, right? Things like marriage systems, governments, uh, educational institutions, all of those are cultural adaptations, which allow us to better survive in our environment. So as you're kind of moving through the course and we start talking about all these different traits that kind of led to uh, the development of the genus Homo and then later to Homo sapiens um, in and of themselves, I want you to kind of think of these traits and look at them in terms of, well, what adaptation or what kind of function did they provide throughout our evolutionary history? And with that, we kind of close the lecture on uh, modern biological human diversity. Um, please make sure you go and watch the other two lectures as well as the video from this week.